Good morning, everyone. So today uh, I decided to change the last minute, not the last minute, but a few days ago while, while the course was going on, I decided to change uh, the topic slightly uh, because uh, this, in this way it allows me to talk about several things that have been uh, addressed during these days. And so it gives a chance to give not really a summary, but at least uh, um, touch every, every, every topic. So we talk about uh, magma chamber formation, giving a mechanical perspective. There have been already many studies to, uh, in literature uh, work, uh, tackling how um, the thermal aspect of magma chamber formation, convection, crystallization, and uh, migration of melt into uh, melt pockets. And here I will give a mechanical perspective um, induced by loading and load uh, surface loads and how magma chambers are influenced uh, by, by the loads of a volcanic edifice while it is growing and while maybe it produces a caldera. Valerio already talked a lot about unloading for calderas. I will touch it uh, too and uh, give it a broader uh, perspective. So uh, magma chambers are thought to be uh, large crystalline moshes. Um, we idealize often this uh, complex geometry uh, by taking ellipsoids or spheres, as we showed, as uh, also Paul showed during his talks. Um, they generally form by accumulation of magma pockets. They may form by accumulation of plutons. They may form by accumulation of dikes or of seals or of funnel-shaped intrusions. <clears throat> what I would like to, to, to talk to today is that, uh, so, okay, and one control, we, as we saw by, by Claude, Claude has done a lot of work on um, <coughs> checking the influence on the propagation of these dikes uh, by, by the load of a volcano. Um, I would like to expand on this and uh, say that uh, the edifice history, so construction, frank collapse, deglaciation, drainage of summit lakes, any um, <coughs> process that, that changes the um, loading on the surface, but also tectonic processes, for example, crustal thinning, if we, if we see volcanoes as actually a larger scale uh, tectonic features, but also orogenesis, fault scarp development, how this not only influence uh, magma storage depth, which is what uh, he addressed during his talk, but also magma chamber shape, possibly, and also typical eruption size as a consequence of shape. Um, this was shown by, by Thorsten, this is his seminal work in 2000, where he um, presented a numerical model that, uh, for the calculation of the trajectories in different stresses. He talked about that already. I will talk about, uh, I just focus on some aspect that he didn't have uh, much time to address. Um, so here in this figure, we see that uh, um, so we see several things, like load is attracting dikes. If they are more buoyant, they care uh, about the stresses a bit less. If they are less buoyant, they really follow uh, quite um, strictly the trajectories of uh, principal stresses. This is an additional model uh, done by McAfee et al. in 2011, where we show a couple more features. One feature is that uh, Okay, we see also the deviation of dikes. Here, these dikes are not interacting with each other. They are just displayed um, one uh, close to each other for, uh, as a summary diagram. And also, this shows that uh, whatever the direction at which they start, they tend to deviate and be attracted by a volcanic load. But we also see another thing, which is what uh, actually uh, Claude pointed out, that they stop. So they are attracted, but then they get arrested just below the surface due to the strong compression that the edifice is exerting on their tips. Here we see that depending on their dimensions, so this was also one of the questions, uh, small dikes, big dikes, one 
one of the possible effects is that a larger dike is more buoyant, is more, uh, maybe more buoyant if the magma is buoyant, and may have a higher driving pressure, and therefore is able to erupt even if uh, most dikes would uh, stop. There is another thing that we can see here that was not pointed out in this paper, it came uh, to my mind later, which is that uh, a strong volcanic load is attracting dikes in vertical trajectories. So they, are, they, may be, they may come from very far away, but really if they come from relatively below, then they, they will um, form some body below the, the volcano, which will have... Uh, um, vertically elongated shape. So before going a little bit more into this, I would like to um, explain two methods um, that, are that may be used uh, one together with the other to study these processes. So one is this boundary element uh, modeling of that propagation. The figure here is from Macafari et al, but it's uh, exactly uh, at least how the model is constructed as Thorsten developed it in 2000. So how does it work? Um, so here we, what we do, we take a lot of uh, these locations. These locations are formulas that uh, are developed, they work at scale from the nanoscale, from crystal scale to tectonic scale, um, and they describe the stress and the displacement due to, and in crystals it would be an imperfection. In geology it would be a discontinuity in the earth. So in this case we open, sometimes we may shear, so we take actually two different formulas for this location, not only tensile but also deep slip to account for this shear, especially when the dikes bend. Um, and what do we do? We, we create um, discretization over the dike surface, and then we require that the stress at the center of each dislocation is equal to the difference between um, magma pressure and lithostatic pressure, so what was called overpressure during these days. Uh, crucial is in these models that the dislocations are interacting, meaning that the stress caused by each dislocation on all the others is taken into account. So the stress at the center will be um, so you will have several um, parts of it. One is a dislocation number one on dislocation number one. Then you will have dislocation number two on number one. So you will have a lot of co coefficients, which are called influence coefficients, and then in the end you will have this delta P as your um, known vector. So basically you build up a very big not excessively big, a big linear system, depending on how many dislocations you want to put, and then you may add to the, to the system also some other constraints, for example, magma compressibility, and then you say that while my dike is ascending, for example, so you may ask that the volume is conserved if you think that you are losing very little volume in the tail, or you may, uh, you may say not volume is conserved, but I take into account compressibility. So if pressure is decreasing, I will have actually a little volume increase. So you may put your physics, add your physics into this model. Um, and then in order to get propagation, what do you do? You check um, virtual elongation of one little dislocation. So you add one dislocation at the tip. You do it in a fan of possible angles. And then you calculate how much energy would be released in this step. And the trajectory that is preferred is the one that releases the maximum stress, the maximum uh, strain energy. Therefore, um, in this way you select the trajectory. Um, put, uh, so it's uh, crucial to know your stresses, as we discussed already in the past, because uh, the stresses and the dislocation, so the, the dikes that enters into the stresses, um, I mean the energy depends on the normal stresses, on the shear stresses, and on the opening and shearing that the dike will have in the stress field. So if your stress field is wrong, your result will be wrong. Therefore, a lot of effort needs to be put really in understanding the stresses. Uh, one more thing is uh, there may be also a, comp a gravitational component, so if you have a buoyant magma you need to 
maximize the release and not only of uh, elastic energy, but you may also take into account gravitational energy to get a total energy. Another uh, type of uh, method that you can use and it's very good to complement this type of models, is uh, experiments in gelatin. I will show you a couple of movies just to show you um, how these uh, movies are instructive. To me, they were uh, very, very instructive. I really understood a lot uh, through these models. So I will show you just uh, one or two movies. So why, why are there... Um, so complementary because the model, most like models are in 2D. And therefore, you um, lose the third dimension component. And we saw also, Claude uh, talked a lot about that, that if you, if you lose the third dimension, for example, you are not able to, to model when a dike is ascending and then uh, propagating laterally because you only take a one cross section. So then you have to turn your cross section and this is very difficult. So one very um, wished for development is to go to 3D. So this is one uh, important aspect that needs to be addressed in the future. So here, it's not working very well. I just get out of the presentation because I would like to show the movies. So I just look for them. Okay, so just, uh, just a couple of them, just to show you um, how they can be used. So in this movie here, we have a homogeneous medium and we have an injection of a dike at the bottom of a gelatin that has been put into the refrigerator and is therefore stiff. So the gel the, the, and we are injecting with a syringe air at the bottom of the container. So you see that something develops that really looks like a dike. It has uh, this shape that was also pointed out by Thorsten. It's uh, similar to, to a shape that is seen in the field, except maybe for the tail that is getting really here thin, so really very close. This would not be true. You would have a, a little tail that is left behind. And you see that you develop completely spontaneously this geometry of a tabular intrusion, vertical. Um, and uh, with the, in this case, we have a linear um, overpressure profile because we have air in gelatin. So we, we, just, we just injected air. And then we have eruption. And uh, just to show you another, a couple, just two, two cases. This what, one here. What sort of density would air style do? Okay, this is a. This is a, so there. There is a lot of consideration to scaling that we may discuss later because it's a bit longer. Okay. So it it's a density is one, and so but uh, viscosity is another one. There are many many considerations. So this one here shows you what happens if you have a, a layer and uh, the, I'll just put it a bit ahead because it's slow otherwise. Okay, so here we have a, a more compliant gelatin on top of a stiffer one. And so we see that there are a lot of features that uh, just occur spontaneously because you have these cracks propagating. And then the last one, I have more and they are, uh, Nice to watch. The last one is this one. So here, the, you will see that the crack will stop at the interface because actually you have a stiffer m material at the top. And then once you inject, it cannot really penetrate. It just uh, propagates laterally until at some point, instead of penetrating in the upper medium, it develops something like this. So similar to a seal. 
This is not the only way that you can form a seal. There are many ways. But um, um, the point is, you will see all these 3D effects. And if you complement numerical methods with analog experiments, then you may have information on the velocity. You may have information on the 3D aspects. While the numerical methods allows you to change all the parameters quite uh, easily and quickly, and therefore you can explore a lot of models without uh, the uh, effort that you have to do in, in the laboratory. I showed, I, I, unfortunately, I don't have any good movies for topography effects, but uh, this is also to illustrate how this experiment here was done. It's in gelatin and it has some brick on the surface of the gelatin. And so you see the same effect that the numerical models reproduce. And it is that a crack, even if it is relatively offset from the volcano, it's going to be attracted by the volcano and then stop at the, just below because of the compression that is generated. If they are not, ex so if uh, magma is not coming so much offset from the volcano but uh, from below, they will actually be relatively vertical features. But then what happens? So, so Valerio already talked about unloading. So here we have uh, a paper about uh, unloading due to glacier melting in Iceland, the glaciation. Um, so if you take a load away, then you have the opposite. Instead of putting forces that push on your medium and compress it like this, making sigma 1 very strongly towards the load, you do actually the opposite. You lift some, some weight away, and then what you do, you pull. And basically, you create a sigma 3, which is completely flipped. And then uh, you promote something that is actually deflected away from the volcano. If you have a source below, magma will tend to get away. This is actually very common, much more common than people think. And uh, there are so many cases, for example, also intrusions at El Hierro, uh, flank collapse uh, episodes that uh, drive dikes away and they are not any longer. So you start to have a flank eruptions. You start to have uh, lateral propagation when you have these cases. There are many, many cases, and if you, t if you keep this unloading and loading in mind, it becomes much more clear. So Valerio already, so I'm not going to spend a lot of uh, time on this because Valerio already explained it. So if you put uh, forces that pull into the uh, air, the caldera floor, due to the removal of weight that uh, was caused, then you uh, end up with a sigma 3 vertical, and then you promote seals. And if uh, this uh, uh, stress pattern is actually only below the caldera, then it fades away while the f if you have a volcano with flanks, uh, you start to have the effect of topography. And the effect of topography is actually to, to drive dikes uh, laterally, as we saw by Thorsten when he was talking about the uh, stress gradients. So therefore, you go from a seal, you need to go from a seal to a radially propagating dike, and the only way they can do is to twist and then go. And this actually was seen by uh, Marco Bagnardi into, his, uh, uh, into analyzing the formation at Fernandina. Now, what about the development of a, of a magma chamber? So suppose that you have a stable structure, really like a stable caldera. Uh, then what, what you would do is to promote seal ascent. You would have several seals. If it's only one, probably it will freeze away relatively quickly. But if you have a, rel a relatively high supply, and if you have a stable stress field, then you may add several of th those seals. And then through thermal effects, develop a big body below the caldera. This depends also on magma composition, because anyway, basalts are more mobile, so you may erupt them relatively easily. Still, you can develop a magma, magmatic systems. Uh, if magma is uh, felsic, then you may find actually that they are less mobile because they are much more viscous, and then you have even more stable system. And uh, so now, of course, uh, we have a question, which is uh, the chicken and the egg. Because the usual view is that uh, if you have a big magmatic system, then you can have a caldera. Well, here what I'm telling you is actually the opposite. If you have a caldera, you develop a big magmatic system because the rims are, are those that are going to stop the seals. So once you have a seal, 
it will stop at the rim, and therefore you develop in this way um, something quite large. Um, we can debate about this. So of course, of course, I'm not telling you that uh, it's just like this. I'm telling you that mechanical models point at this effect that uh, so far has not really been recognized. So basically, what is the message of this first part? If you have a big load, if you have a big volcano, you develop an, a vertically elongated magmatic system. It cannot be very large because it will stay narrow, relatively narrow, the more so, the more the volcanic load is uh, developed, and the more so, the less the, volca the volcano has not a caldera. If the volcano has a caldera on top, then it's uh, a bit more complex. This is seen because at Mount St. Helen, Mount St. Helen is a big stratovolcano, and it's seen that it's, uh, Paul mentioned that the uh, a good model for a magma chamber there is a, a prolate el ellipsoid. Etna has the same, has a vertically elongated system. While Toba, for example, here, uh, through seismic um, analysis, was found to have a system composed by, by a lot of seals, one stacked over the other. Anyway, the the um, structure is more horizontal, while in the other case, the structure is more vertical. This is simplified as actually what happens. Uh, this was also shown by Thorsten. Uh, dikes interact when they ascend because you will have the stress caused by the previous dike. There are several studies looking at this, and you can see that uh, uh, one, so you, the first one will be possibly vertical, but then the second one will intersect the first one. The third one will intersect these two. And then in this way, you build a structure, depending on what uh, thermal effects you have, depending on the supply rate, you may have different way to develop this. But in, in, uh, in general, you will, um, so and depending on the stress, you may find something in the end that is more vertically elongated or more spherical or more uh, laterally elongated only if you allow if you have either a lot of compression, this could also be a mechanism, for example, in the Andes, or if you have a topography um, change, like um, a mass waste event. There are several uh, papers that point out that if you have intersecting uh, dislocations, so it's a, ther it's a theoretical paper, so also by Bonafede, that was my PhD advisor. Uh, he has a paper where he shows that it's completely um, an analog to have a pressurized cavity, a point source, and the three intersecting dislocations in all directions from a theoretical point of view, if you are far enough from these uh, um, sources, because the, you need to be in the point source approximation, so you need to be far enough. Anyway, as soon as you are outside, already they have very, very similar fields. Three dislocations intersecting doesn't seem to be a particularly realistic um, arrangement, but if you think at something like this, it's not the three dislocations intersecting, but it's several dikes intersecting with each other, meaning that you cannot distinguish from the surface these geometries um, from the formation, because they will be totally equivalent. And this may, may be one answer to the question, why does the Moggy source work so well? Because actually, from a theoretical point of view, or from a stress field point of view, from a deformation point of view, they are equal, unless you go very, very close. Unless they are very shallow, and you can may see some uh, deviations from, from this. So this is a desert rose crystal. Think of this arrangement. And here is a figure from uh, Daniela Kuhn master thesis, a PhD thesis in Hamburg who showed that the stress field, once you add one dike, one dike, one dike, you really develop this stress field similar to uh, an ellipsoid, which was also shown by Thorsten. This is a tomography uh, for Mount Etna, which shows this uh, famous high rigidity body that is below Mount Etna. It's this uh, lila body here uh, that has a very, very high VP velocity, very strong VP velocity meaning that it's probably an, accumula battle, an accumulation of basalt. And uh, 
one can figure out why, why exactly this shape. I think there is a strong control on this from the topographic load. And um, OK, Etna is not a perfect cone. And there are other stresses, extensional stresses, and sliding of a flank. Maybe if one goes well into the stresses, then one figures out exactly why the shape of this body. Most dikes then now ascend to the left of it, to the west. While in uh, big calderas, we have the opposite arrangement. Uh, now I want to go into rifts. Uh, Cindy has talked a lot about rifting. We have, um, and I want to make the argument that is similar, just at a larger scale. So in rifts, what do you have? You have that uh, crustal extension thins the crust. It's a different process. You are not removing anything. You are just thinning. However, if you have uh, lower crustal layers and magma in lower crustal layers, what they will experience is a decrease of weight. At least uh, this model um, assumes this, uh, that you have a decrease of weight due to crustal thinning and knacking. So here, you see, first, uh, first uh, thinning is uh, uh, maybe ductile, but then at some point you develop faults, and then these faults, uh, which are the border faults for the rift, uh, absorb all the deformation, and therefore you start to, de to develop a deep graben. This is the graben at Lake Baikal. It's filled with sediments and with a lake, uh, and it's very deep. It's 10 kilometers deep. And uh, during a seismic studies, these authors, Tubo and Nielsen, observed that uh, there was in the lower crust, so they found a completely flat maw. The assumption in general is that the maw will uplift because while you are necking the crust, you will thin from above and thin from below and then cause an ascent of the asthenosphere. Mm -hmm. And this actually would be the cause of the melting because you are decompressing the magma. We didn't talk at all about melting, but uh, decompression melting is the, maybe the main mechanism for melting on the Earth. So you need to take some volume of magma and uh, decompress it. You can do it by uh, lifting it up, or you can also decrease uh, some uh, weight from, from the top. <coughs> and then uh, they found a lower crust. So the mow is flat. There is no uplift of the mow. But they found uh, um, a very high VP velocity between that of basalt and that expected for the lower class. So, and also what they saw is a strong, strong, strong reflection at many layers. So in the end, they, they interpreted it as intrusives, seals. Um, this is actually very common in many rifts. I have not seen at all, so while I was revising literature, I have not seen an, a single rift that uh, for which if you look at it, you don't find seals in the lower crust. And this was long uh, thought to be a problem, because actually most rifts occur during extension, so actually you should expect to have vertical dikes. And so why, why, why that? So a previous hypothesis was that it was a rheological problem and discontinuity, rheological discontinuity, and uh, not a stress, uh, a stress factor. But uh, what I am arguing here, that actually it's a result of the decrease of weight at the top occurring over long time scales. I'm objecting to myself uh, for this hypothesis because I think how long will this uh, decompression last? This is millions of years sometimes. However, when I object to myself, I answer to myself, OK, this is true. And it, it should be actually looked uh, into more detail. However, how are you going to compensate for the compressions and compressions. It's very easy to dissipate shear stresses. You may find an earthquake, you may have ductile motions, you may have many processes that dissipate shear stresses, especially if you have high heat. But how are you going to dissipate a strong compression or decompression? So maybe this will last longer. I don't know. I'll throw it to the audience. Anyway. Um, what is observed in the Baikal Rift and in many rifts is that the most volcanic field, so there is no evidence at all of any magma above the, ma the seals. Most uh, volcanic fields, and some of them are really very large, extremely large, they are at uh, quite a distance f 
from the rift itself. And so the same model that uh, Thorsen de developed may be applied to study how, uh, if you believe at this unloading process, how this uh, will uh, change stresses in the crust and therefore turn into seals any dikes that will ascend from below and force them, and uh, actually most of them get even stuck because they, they lose all their buoyancy, meaning that they are buoyant, the magma may be buoyant, However, they are horizontal, and therefore all their driving pressure due to buoyancy is lost because they are horizontal and they don't have so much stresses at the tip due to their buoyancy. Therefore, most of them get stuck and only a few escape and they go to the surface far away from the rift. Did you have a density contrast though at the base of the So they are buoyant, I think in this uh, no, in this model, not. Once, so first they would take these trajectories, but then, of course, over the millions of years, every seal would be the next magma chamber and nucleate maybe a little dike. This dike will also be forced to become a seal. You will nucleate another little dike. This dike will be forced to be a seal. In this way, you develop stocked seals, which is what is seen in many rifts. And then if you really have a continuing... Uh, extension and continuous melt supply, then you may reach, I forgot to say something, the color here is the inclination of sigma 3. It's completely vertical where it's red, so 90 degrees or, or 100 here, especially at the center, and it's uh, horizontal here. Here you see this pattern here, so for some reason of stress, uh, um, for some reason, you have below, just below the unloading, actually sigma 3 is not vertical. Sigma 3 is vertical in a vertical depth that is below. So what do you do? So if you develop a lot of seals, all here, all here, all here, at some point you will reach this level. This will be the last seal, the shallowest seal. And then from there, the only way is to develop a vertical dike because here sigma 3 is horizontal. And then you see... Actually, it may be just stress, what you see also in the upper dikes, that you, you see magma chambers, they are seals. Some of them are below the volcanoes. This uh, changes a little bit the stress field, the overall stress field. And then from there, you start to nucleate dikes that propagate laterally in this way. Thank, thanks for this question. So you may actually calculate it quite quickly. If you have a gradient of one kilometer depth, uh, your density, I don't know, you take uh, easy numbers. You, you do rho GH. Fill it with water and together. Yes. So actually, the stresses are very strong because extensional stresses are limited by the faulting processes, right? So once you, have, you start to develop faulting, much more than 5 megapascal extension you cannot accumulate. While this, if you have a deep graben, you may reach very easily 10, 20 megapascals, very easily, because you are... Uh, so this is, this is, thank you for this question, because this is actually crucial. It may be a dominating effect. And the extension will uh, modulate this by, by turning the trajectories vertical once you are far away. But below, you will have this strong effect. So the same phenomenon can be uh, applied to much uh, smaller scale features, so like for example here is a fault scarps of the dimension of a few tens of meters. But even this, if you have a fault scarp, the difference in load between here and here will attract the dikes to the highest part. Um, Valerio provided some beautiful pictures of volcanoes that are just above the fault scarp, on the foot wall of the normal fault. And here, these are two normal faults. You have two steps like this, and most volcanoes are actually right on the normal fault. Some of them are uh, even further away. And uh, there is a, a majority of uh, monogenetic cones on the foot wall, and only a few of them on the fault, which is the usual explained mechanism that you need to have a fault to, to take the magma to the surface. No, you don't. You, magma can, uh, is independent. 
can go on its way to the surface, and only a few of them are uh, um, on the hanging wall of these normal folds. So this would be the view. You may have an uplifted or flat moor, and then you may have seals due to this uh, topography or unloading feature, and then you may, uh, at least in some phases of reef development, and depending on the competition between extension and these unloading forces, you may develop off-rift volcanoes, which are seen in many, many rifts worldwide. And I was wondering, at some point, some people asked, uh, I, my volcanoes are all aligned on, in some lines. So look at, look at these uh, features, look at uh, loadings loads on the surface, because maybe your volcanoes are actually helped by, maybe they are along. So also Cindy showed that uh, this uh, very big volcano was exactly on the footwall of the, of the, of the graben fault. So this is, uh, so the more I look into this in the examples and the more one can see it. There are cases where uh, all the, so like this is the red seeds, uh, rift that has developed into crustal splitting. And all the lava fields, also huge, they are all on one side. Most rifts are not symmetric. The loading and loading is asymmetric. So you need to take this into account. And any asymmetry, of course, in the source below, but also in the grabbing geometry, will drive asymmetry at the surface. This is another example, the Rio Grande Rift, where uh, most of volcanic fields are not in the rift, they are outside. It's uh, these yellow fields here and these red fields here. Okay, this is uh, what happens if the loading is uh, little, and then uh, it's uh, basically the caldera case that uh, Valerio may, may be applied to the caldera case, or to, it may be applied also to shallow rifts. So for example, in Iceland, the the north volcanic zone and the rifts, they are very shallow and they are very broad. Therefore, your uh, vertical sigma 3 area goes deep. Mathematically, it goes deep. And then if you are more shallower, you will have uh, distinct trajectories. So you will, you will have um, separated trajectories. You will not have a focusing of all the magmatism in one point. Uh, this may be also the early stage of rifting when you start to decrease thinning to, to start to thin, but thinning is very little. And I read that in many cases you have a monogenetic volcanism at the beginning of the rift, uh, rifting. And this would be an explanation for that because the unloading is still too little. It's not dominating towards extension, but is, uh, ha it's making the trajectories to be slightly separated from each other. Okay, so this was uh, this part, how we, we may accumulate magma. Of course, it will be more complex than this, and of course, there will be thermal effects. But we may accumulate magma more vertically below stratovolcanoes and more horizontally below calderas. What is the implication for eruptions? Um, So in order to, to, to model this, th there is a very simple way to model this, which is to consider mass output, mass input into a magma chamber or mass output. So these equations are not uh, difficult, I will, I will uh, explain you. So if you have a mass change, you will have rho dv change. But when you make a differentiation, you get rho dv plus v the rho, okay? And so you, if you um, differentiate with respect to pressure, you will have rho dv over the p plus v the rho over the p times the p. And you can define two constants, which are magma compressibility and elastic compressibility of the outer medium, which is not directly the bulk modulus, but depends on shape. And you can write the formulas actually like this. So a variation of mass due to a variation of pressure or a variation of pressure due to a variation of mass, as, as you want to see it, depends on total volume. But not only on total volume, it depends on two quantities. One is how much I can squeeze magma because it's compressible. And the other one, how much I can make space into the medium uh, with pressure. They, they are both important because they happen to be similar, these compressibilities, for most cases. 
Now we will go a little bit more into detail. So magma com to give numbers, magma compressibility, if it is uh, bubble free, is around 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 11 pascals to the minus 1. But it may be much higher, 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 7, depending on the bubble content. If many, many bubbles are there, of course, it's super complex, very much more compressible. And then uh, for uh, magma chambers, and this is the whole point why I put it here, it depends on shape. So if you have uh, um, spherical or an intersecting dike geometry, the for a unit variation of mass, I will have actually a very little, uh, a very high variation in pressure because I, I, because of this incompressibility. So I cannot really make the medium enlarge very much due to the shape factor. While if I have a crack, something tabular, it's very easy to open and therefore pressure will not raise very much. There is another effect that I didn't put here into the slide, which is buoyancy. Suppose that you're stopping an intrusion, not because it reached a neutral buoyancy level, but because it was stress, because you had a vertical sigma 3. Then the magma is buoyant, it's there, it's sitting there, but it's buoyant. It's not neutrally buoyant. Then what you will have, you will have a buoyancy force, which is a vertical integration of, uh, over the vertical distance, uh, uh, the vertical extent of the system. Generally, uh, systems are a few kilometers uh, developed vertically. So if you have, uh, this limits a bit how much it can be vertically developed. Of course, uh, it strongly depends on the density contrast. Anyway, if, even if it's only 50, you reach very easily 5 megapascal by 10, km, by 10 kilometers. So this uh, may be very high stresses in some cases. And these stresses are not dissipated by thermal effects. These stresses stay there. So there were a couple of papers very recently in Nature Geoscience pointing out that buoyancy may be a, a mechanism for, to fuel the largest eruptions. Because if you have... Uh, um, elastic stresses, and if you have uh, thermal effects of uh, large accumulation, there will be a time scale over which they are dissipated, these shear stresses, and you will not break the magma chamber. But then at some point you reach uh, a limit which is due to the buoyancy, and then you may have a very large eruption. Uh, so there are two mechanisms. One is elastic overpressurization, and one is buoyancy. Here, I argue that a seal is uh, the one that can store the most magma without pressurizing very much because it's uh, a crack, so it works well for the elasticity. For elasticity, a dike would be equally good. However, for buoyancy, it's better to have uh, horizontal because then you are not accumulating so much buoyancy pressure. Therefore, if you develop a seal and you can develop it far away, so you have a large caldera, the rim are far away, you have a large rift, the flank of the rifts are far away, you can actually extend the seal, the more magma you have, it will just go ahead in this way, and only at the very last point it will try to erupt. You can actually accumulate huge quantities of magma without pressurizing the system very much. What happens once you open this? You know, you create a conduit to the surface, here there are many effects that I... I didn't investigate yet and I cannot explore now, but just imagine it's very simple. You open a conduit to the surface, you have a pressure gradient there. If your system is very large but very limited vertical extent, both buoyancy pressure and elastic pressure will decrease very little during the eruption. Mm -hmm. So what you create is a huge eruption because what stops eruptions is that at some point you lose the pressure at the magma chamber. There are several cases of dike intrusions and eruptions in Iceland at Kilauea, studied by Paul, studied by Icelandic colleagues, where you see very well that the magma chamber depressurizes very fast during the eruption. But if you have a system which is a very large seal, this will not occur, or it will occur, but it will occur over much long, longer uh, scales. So in this paper by Amorus and Crescentini, 
uh, they calculated the compressibility of different aspect ratios. So here in the middle, here to the uh, my hand, right hand side, you have a prolate ellipsoid, and the compressibility is one over mu. Note that it depends on rigidity. So if, you, if your medium is uh, viscoelastic, this will also drop in time. Um, here in the middle you have spherical, <coughs> spherical aspect ratio. Consider that everything is normalized to the sphere, so therefore sphere is one. But the, the uh, compressibility of a sphere is three over four mu, so slightly lower than a prolate ellipsoid. Anyway, consider that here you are going flat, so you can uh, build it as prolate as you want, it's always one over mu, it doesn't change. However, this changes very much when you go to the, to the other side, hand side. So if you start to have a pancake shapes, shaped magma chambers, um, because the compressibility starts to be dependent on the aspect ratio, A over C. A is the radius and C is the half of the vertical extent. It's actually increasing linearly with that. There is a paper by August Gudmundsson saying that the aspect ratio of seals is 150 to, to 500 in the field. So if you put this number into it, you can see that very easily you go uh, much higher, two orders of magnitude higher, at least, than uh, prolate ellipsoids. This is translated uh, into, so we had these uh, equations that uh, relate mass changes and the pressure changes in conduits. Claude uh, had a lot of these equations. It's a variation of pressures over, over time, depending on the total pressure uh, gradient over a time scale. And the time scale for this problem, if you look at uh, these equations, is uh, of course dependent on mass. So the, the biggest the magma chamber, the, the, the largest is the magma chamber, the longest is the time scale. But look also compressibility. So compressibility plays a big role in, ma in making the eruption big or small. Compressibility is uh, also made, uh, um, so basically the total volume in the end will be, okay, you have a total pressure gradient due to the cond uh, along the conduit that where you are erupting, but the total fraction of volume will be just the compressibility. The value of compressibility times the delta P will tell you exactly what fraction of your magma chamber you can evacuate. And this fraction is very small, exactly due to this, for spherical chambers. You cannot evacuate more than 1 or 3% of the chamber. You can if you have a delta P, which for some reason, siphon effects, whatever, you are really extracting a lot of magma due to your process, uh, but then you will have a collapse. While if you have a, a seal or something shaped like a seal, then uh, uh, you can extract even 10, 20 percent, no problem, because of this equation. And possibly you will not even have a strong collapse. You may have some sagging, as Valerio, sh Valerio did, and uh, as Valerio showed that you have different stages and different uh, stages of caldera development. If you only evacuate one seal or a very, you can end up with uh, no collapse at all. So here I have two batteries. When I was talking this to a co about this to a colleague of mine, he, um, and I told him I, it's like a battery, and he said, yes, it's like a battery, but for two different devices. One is telephone and one is car. When you have a battery for a car, you, require, you want to have a large current very quickly because you need to start your car. You don't care that the supply is continuous. You care only about a short time. Well, if you have a phone, a telephone, you, want to, you don't need uh, a lot of energy or current in a very short time. You need the current to be continuous and reliable for a very long time until you charge it again. So these are, don't be tricked by the fact that uh, I'm telling you larger options, but then uh, the batteries are, uh, you know, the current is very small and here the current is very high. So of course here current will be very high, but consider that, that this one is as big as this one, if not more. So take a phone battery and make it very big. And then <clears throat> you will see that magma chambers are similar to batteries in that they provide uh, 
flow, not, it's not current, it's not uh, charge, it's a flow of mass, and they provide it depending on their design. Not only, so in this case, uh, also shape is a factor, is the design of magma chambers. So this is a figure showing that uh, so um, the eruptive volume depending on aspect ratio. So aspect ratio here you have spheres, here you have uh, seals, and uh, the fact that these curves are uh, bent is a direct consequence of the Amoruso and Crescentini curve that is increasing for that shows that the compressibility is increasing for seals. So depending on what supply of magma you have from below. And uh, this supply here, phi uh, equal to one cubic kilometer per year, is the highest supply rate, I would say, that is, uh, was, um, is observed for large um, igneous provinces. These are the largest eruptions of Earth. They are uh, sometimes in excess of 10,000 cubic kilometers in just one eruption. Several pulses of them, generally large igneous provinces, very often they result into um, continental breakup. Sometimes they don't. One feature, common feature that they have, all of them have, they have crust, lower crustal seals. Uh, it's a common, often it has been seen as a byproduct. Some people have tried to say they are actually large igneous province eruptions are fed from the seal. Here is a reason why they are fed from the seal, because a seal is the optimum system, especially, especially is very large, to keep the eruption going for a very long time without stopping, because there is no depressurization. And only, so, I mean, this kind of extreme flows, you can obtain them for this supply rate only if you have a seal-shaped chamber. The last uh, comment is on thermal aspects because, of course, a seal is a thin structure. It may be a few hundred meters thick. So how do you maintain it? Why it doesn't freeze? I, I would say in these two cases where we have the largest eruption on Earth, one is calderas and one is rifts, is uh, so in the, in the case of the rift, they are in the lower crust. This helps because they can be maintained uh, in the oven, I mean, they are, they are hot down there. There is not much freezing going on. It takes a long time to freeze them away. While in calderas, um, the large accumulation and the fact that stress is, forbids the magma to erupt so very frequently means that they stay there and there, there is, uh, so they are kept uh, hot by a huge uh, body around them which is a crystalline mash, probably reacting elastically during short times of eruptions, possibly not, part of it will not. But anyway, there are a lot of studies which show that accumulations in this body of melt, it's not really a seal, it's not necessarily an intrusion that really goes in between a bedding, but it's something lenticularly shaped. So from a mechanical point of view, it's the same. Um, and they are kept hot by this body around them. So here I'm concluding uh, three messages. So one is that uh, a path to the surface is not simply a fault that the magma can take. This is very overall everywhere. In the literature, you will find this. I'm not saying that dikes don't fall on faults. They do sometimes. But they can just create their own pathway. And uh, when they do, they will follow the stresses very often. And therefore, you need to figure out the stresses of a particular situation to understand why melting is here and the volcano is here. It's a frequent situation. Uh, if you apply these mechanical models to magma chamber formation, you discover that uh, stratovolcanoes favor vertically elongated systems, while calderas favor horizontally uh, developed systems. This is seen from crustal deformation too. I have not seen a caldera where the source uh, um, inferred from INSAR is not a seal. Uh, they are all always seals. And I have uh, up to yet not seen a stratovolcano where the source is not elongated unless it has a caldera on top. And then this has strong uh, implications for the eruptive potential. 
because the larger compressibility, I have not talked about the compressibility. So compressibility is uh, sum, of course, of the structural term and also magma compressibility. This, of course, will play a strong role during eruptions. Not so much uh, these huge basal flows because they are, they are not particularly compressible in terms of magma, but of course in caldera eruptions it's a different matter. So this will help even more to get a larger eruption. Uh, so structural and magma compressibility lead to large typical eruptive size of a given volcano. Okay. <laughs>